All right, guys, so we brought you here to this campfire today because we heard that you guys have some pretty big questions and there's questions that you brought on a whole bunch of different topics. We're gonna start on the topic of prayer. So does anybody have any questions about prayer? Why do we pray? It's a good question. Let me answer first by saying why we don't pray. We don't pray uh, in order to convince God to do all the things that we want. God is not a genie in a bottle. Uh, he doesn't live in a lantern. Uh, it's bigger than that, actually. You know, sometimes at camp, you play with those slingshots. When you shoot a slingshot, you shoot it and it goes in the air and you hope that it lands in the right way. God is not like that. So we don't shoot prayers up, hoping that God catches them and then throws them back down where they should be. God instead, if you think of like surfing, you're out in the ocean, it's this big movement and you catch a wave and you go with it. That's why we pray. God catches us in his will, in his character, and we're sort of carried by, by his heart. And so when we pray, we, we sort of offer up where we're at to God and then God connects with us. Simply put, it's just like talking to God, but more importantly, it's allowing God to talk to us and move us in his direction. I was just wondering, is there a correct way to pray? Um, really quickly, can you guys show me how you pray? Like, what do you do with your hands? What do you do with your eyes? What do you do with your self, right? Guess what? You don't have to do that when you pray. You don't have to fold your hands. You don't have to close your eyes. You can, that's great. You can totally do that. Some people put their hands on their lap open like this. Some people actually look upwards as if they're looking to where they think heaven is and they open their eyes and they talk to God that way. And some people speak out loud and some people kind of just talk in their mind. And then others, they just sit and listen to how God wants to speak to them. So why does God answer some prayers and not others? The quickest answer is this. Mm -hmm. uh, but the bigger answer is um, I have two little girls and sometimes, actually often, if I were to put a plate of cookies on the table or a plate of vegetables on the table, what do you think that they would choose? The cookies, almost each and every time, right? But what's the better choice? To help their life, to help their bones, to, he to help their muscles? the vegetables. Is this bad all the time? No, sometimes this is good. But for the majority of time, this is the preference. And so God, who actually calls himself in, in, in a lot of uh, different sections of scripture, father cares for us with a father, a mother's heart, with a parental heart. And so when we pray, again, it's not just uh, getting God to do what we want. It's actually God um, moving us in the direction of what his heart is. The simple answer to the question is, I don't know. We don't know why God chooses one way or the other, but we do know what God's heart is like. And in Jesus, we see uh, God's heart, God's, God's character uh, fully embodied. And so there are times where God's answer to prayer will be, yes, I want that for you. That's in step with my character. There are other times where God's heart is no. That's like just a big plate of cookies. You don't need it, and there's something better that I have for you. Make sense? Yeah. Great questions on prayer, you guys. Thank you so much, that was amazing. Hello, it's good to have you with us today. My name is Jared, and this is my first time in this chair on this side of the camera. If you're in Canada or the US, or maybe there are some other parts of the world where this applies this weekend, today is the end of a long weekend. So I, I don't know about you, but we had fantastic weather. Uh, we spent some time at the beach, paddled down a river. We even had a campfire, like that video that we just saw, um, and really just loved spending time outside. So, you know, Coming to church on a long weekend, it's one of those things, right? Like, do we do it? Do we not? Um, but wherever you're joining us today, wherever you're from, um, whether that's at home or whether you're by a lake somewhere, we're really glad that you're here. Gathering is an essential part of following Jesus. And online is one way we can do that, but it's certainly not the only way. Uh, we get together in locations across Ontario, uh, whether that's on Sundays or in home church and other types of events throughout the week. And, you know, a more unique way to get connected that we talked about just recently is something called TMHU. And we wanted to follow up that little campaign with a story from someone in the Meeting House community who joined in. Let's take a look. Hey, everyone. I'm Dan, and I'm here today with Curtis. Curtis is a home church elder from the Oakville site, and you recently took the TMHU course on discipleship. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I was looking at the TMHU course list and there was lots of great topics that I wanted to dive into. And, uh, you know, I, I felt like discipleship sounded like an interesting one that I could probably use a refresher course on. I've been a Christian for many years, Jesus follower for many years, but, uh, and I saw who was leading it and wanted to learn from him. So I decided to dive in. And I think one of the things that was um, encouraging for me on that is I wanted to be around the people that also wanted to dive into that topic. So it was a great opportunity to do that. That's awesome. And this course, was it everything that you were expecting? You know what, it turned out to be a lot more than I was expecting. Uh, like I said, I've been a Jesus follower for many years. So, you know, I felt like I knew what discipleship was, but I had always thought of it in terms of how can I help others in their journey to be more with Jesus. Mm. And the one thing that really stood out to me from the course was how I can't lead people where I haven't been myself. And so recognizing that it's actually about my relationship with Jesus, about going beyond just a very thin layer of discipleship to actually having a depth to that relationship was uh, really stood out. And, you know, number of topics that we were able to talk about as a group, because now we've got about 10 to 12 people that were all chewing on this together and trying to apply it to our lives. It's like, well, what does it mean to actually lead out of weakness? Right? That was one of the topics that came up. How do we understand our limits and how far we can go and, you know, working with our time? How do we mm. prioritize being with Jesus? So all of those things we were able to chew on together. And, you know, it's really changed the way that I see discipleship. It has even changed the way that I live ever since having taken the course. I mean, it sounds grandiose to say that, but it's, it's true. That's incredible. If anyone is on the fence about taking one of these TMHU courses, what would you say to them? Yeah, I mean, I really kind of looked at how I was spending my time, right? And so if I've got a given Monday evening, am I going to spend that by just working harder at my job? Am I going to spend that just chilling out in front of Netflix? Like, what am I going to spend my time with? And yeah. it seemed like this was a good thing to help me become the person that I felt like I was being called to be. Uh, and so, and I wanted to do that with other people that felt the same. And so if that's somebody that's on the fence and they're wondering, hey, is this a good opportunity for me to go deeper? It, you know, it, it probably is. Awesome. Well, if you're interested in taking one of these TMHU courses, you can find out more at themeetinghouse.com. You can also talk to a home church elder or a local pastor about the different courses that are being offered. And please, take advantage of all these resources that are available. Curtis, thanks for being here today, and we'll see you next time. If you've been tracking with us for a while, you may have heard of TMHU. You may have even taken a course yourself. It's great to hear from Curtis, who signed up, participated, and took a course this last time around. And it was a great encouragement to hear from him just to think about what we're doing with our time, intentionally turning our time towards God, whether that's on a random Monday evening or something like that. TMHU courses come and go, and there actually aren't any scheduled at this moment, but keep your ears open if that's something you're interested in. And more importantly, let's stay connected this summer. If you're looking for ways to connect, reach out to us in the comments or by email, send an email to your lead pastor, join a mailing list if you're not on one already, uh, or follow up one of our parishes on social media. Another idea that we're keen on around here is one story, and that's our kids and youth curriculum. As you go about your summer, maybe you're sometimes here, sometimes there, remember that you can find one story video stories like the campfire prayer story that we saw at the beginning of our time together this morning by searching one story on YouTube or by typing in this link. All these tools that bring us together are made possible because of the generous support of our community. So although you can check it out anytime, now would be a good time to check out the giving link and consider giving to support what we're doing together, following Jesus, growing together, and sharing his love. In a moment, we're going to sing together, and this is a way of aligning our thoughts, our attention, and our affections towards God. And then we're gonna hear from Jeremy as we start a new teaching series called Moses and Jesus. I'll see you back here after that. Welcome. We are so glad you joined us on this long weekend. I hope that it is some rest in the busyness of plans. I'm sure you're rushing out of here. But why don't we stand if you're able and willing to join us while we spend some time worshiping God, praising him for how good he is and how involved in our lives he is. Um, and I pray that we're aware that he is in this room with us right now. I 
I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me Oh, his love Oh, his love for me The sun sets free Oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I am At last he has ransomed me, oh, his grace from me. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. Feel free to stand with us again. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my Till all my fears are gone.
from my mother's womb. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. felt like I had something to share. I went to a worship leader conference last weekend, and I felt so convicted about something that they, they talked about. Um, I went wanting practical help on how to run a band and all these things that I don't really know what I'm doing. But, um, but I walked away thinking more about my heart. Where's my heart? What's my posture? And how do I feed that? And how do I really learn who God is? And how do I connect to him? Um, because I go to church every Sunday, and I hang out with my small group, and I do all the things, but it's not about the checklist, and it's not about just showing up. Um, it is work. Relationships are work, and that's what it is. So I check boxes, but that's not what it's about. Do I intentionally carve out time to read my Bible? Do I really make time to be still and pray? Do I spend as much time talking to God as I spend talking about him? And if I'm honest, no. The truth is no. Um, I haven't been as disciplined as I should be. 
I haven't intentionally spent time with him as I should so that I'm constantly growing and able to lead out of a good place. And they really called us out on being lukewarm. Um, Revelations 3, 15 to 16 says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either hot or cold. And it's the idea that hot or cold is better than lukewarm because hot can be hot and healing. Colds can be cold and refreshing. But lukewarm is, the word is putrid, which I just don't like, but that's what it is. <laughs> And um, one of the speakers was Daryl Johnson. He's, he's Canadian, and he just, he really talked about being lukewarm and what it means and how we're, we're so preoccupied and distracted with the things in our lives, and we aren't, um, we aren't preoccupied with Jesus the way that we should be. So we can be hot and healing or cold and refreshing, but lukewarm is neither. I figure I'm not the only one who needs this reminder, I hope. <laughs> not alone. I think it's one of those like secret Christian shames. Like we don't really read our Bible like we should and memorize it. And anyways, we're all in this together. So let's not give in to the spirit of compromise. This is my hope for us or laziness or being too busy for God. Let's prioritize him. Let's invite him into the busyness. Let's invite God in and praise him because he is worthy and he is deserving. So in our musical worship, let's not be lukewarm. Let's start with worship right here, right now. We have one more song. And let's remember, we don't just worship with one another in this room. We are worshiping with angels. We are worshiping with the departed. And we're worshiping with the Trinity. So how much joy does that bring, knowing that it's not just us in this room? We might feel like few, but there is so much going on that we can't see. And let's worship knowing that. Well, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. You came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. to dancing you give beauty for ashes you 
turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can turn. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. Biblical law has always been about participating in God and finding true joy in life. That is, obedience is not intended to limit freedom, but to provide and facilitate it. Edward W. Clink III. Show me the way, show me the way. Bring me tonight to the mountain and take my confusion away and show me the way. Sticks. The primary purpose of the law is not to frighten the evildoer by the threat of punishment. Rather, 
It is a gracious light to the feet of those who have been saved by grace alone and now wish to live a life of grateful obedience. Stephen Ferris True faith or true knowledge begets love and love begets obedience to the commandments of God. Menno Simons Love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his decrees, his laws, and his commands always. Moses. If you love me, keep my commands. Jesus. Well, good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the beginning of our new series, Moses, Jesus, and the space in between. We're really excited to launch uh, part of our summer series. If you've been a part of the Meeting House for any length of time, you may recall that part of what we typically do as a summer rhythm is to take the month of July or a number of weeks to the summer and land ourselves in the Old Testament. Spend some time learning about the characters that we find in the Old Testament and the way that they ultimately point us to Jesus. So this is week one of that. You'll notice I'm not up here alone. I'm actually not teaching this Sunday, but I get the esteemed privilege of introducing you to Jeremy McClung who is teaching this morning. So part of the, yeah, we can clap for Jeremy. I like that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> part of the practice that we as the teaching team were talking about is the opportunity that we have to hear from so many gifted voices that we already have in our community. And Jeremy is the parish pastor of our Perry Sound location. That's a little bit of a tongue twister, Perry Sound parish pastor. Um, and he and the others that you'll hear throughout this series really are trusted and valued voices to us. But we realize that not everyone's going to know who they are unless you're part of Perry Sound. So shout out to Perry Sound this morning. Uh, but Jeremy's going to start with us. Jeremy, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about you, your family, a little bit where you've come from. Sure. Yeah, glad to be here. My, uh, my family, part of my family's with me, my wife and two daughters and my son's working. But uh, we've kind of hung around the edges of the meeting house for a while, had friends who worked here, attended here, had their lives changed here. But I've only been in Perry Sound for the last 10 months or so. Before that, uh, we had planted a church in Muskoka, in, in the Huntsville area. And I had pastored that for almost 15 years. Um, and was really looking forward to a break <laughs> when God tricked me and uh, had another assignment. So. <laughs> and it's been easy, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, this year has been what I expected. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't want to take up more of our teaching time, but let me pray for you, and then we'll head into our teaching together. Jesus, thank you that you are here. We posture and position ourselves with an openness to be prepared to hear from you by your Spirit and through Jeremy. And I pray right now that you fill him with your Spirit. Give him your words and your peace as we enter into teaching together, and we pray in your name. Amen. Thanks, Carmen. So before I actually get started, I want to do two things. The first is to give a shout out to my friends in Perry Sound because, you know, they just, they feel, would feel left out if I didn't do that. So they're a great group of people. Um, they tell me that they're the best parish. So I don't know, I don't know what other people have to say, but I believe it at least since I've been there. Um, so hi, Perry Sound. The second, uh, I want to actually just speak to you in this room to those in our other parishes, to those who are watching online, who, who are still part of this church, who have stuck with it, um, I just want to say, it's been a real privilege, despite it not being exactly uh, how any of us expected. It really has been a privilege to be a part of this church for the last 10 months, getting to see some of the inside things and getting to know the leaders. There's such a quality group of staff and pastors here that it's, it's been an honor, really, to see how they have sought to follow Jesus. Of course, you know, in every situation, nothing's always perfect, but their hearts are in the right place. And the people who come here, you guys, I'm impressed with. And just in general, there's something about the meeting house that's unique, that's special. Maybe it's the authenticity, maybe it's the love for Jesus, the, the joy even in the midst of difficulty. I'm not sure that I was able to put my finger on it when I was trying to figure out how to express it, but I, I hope you sense that it's still there, that it's still worth 
working for. And that it's worth it to stay and to be part of this rebuilding process. And so I just want to say, like, if you don't realize that this is still a special place, as an outsider, as a newcomer, wow, it really is. And I hope, you, I hope you're thankful for that. And I hope you're still proud to call this church your home. So... Do I get my $50 now? Okay. So today, as uh, Carmen said, we're starting a new series called Moses, Jesus, and the Spaces in Between. We've got like the central figure in the Old Testament, Moses, the central figure in the New Testament, and in our lives as Christians, Jesus. And how do they, how do they compare? How are they similar? How are they different? And that's, uh, we're going to be exploring that in, in a bunch of different ways in the series. But, but there's one thing that's a little bit out of place, and that is the original plan was that this morning would be an introduction. And it's not. Uh, this morning was supposed to happen next week, and so we're doing kind of a Star Wars thing. We're starting with episode two. I don't know all that was planned for episode one, except that Jimmy was going to take us into the wilderness. And I'm going to, maybe he got lost in the wilderness, you know. I'm going to take us to the mountain. Actually, two mountains today. And at both of these mountains, we're going to find that God is giving his people his Torah, his instructions, his law. We're going to hear what it means for God to speak his commandments. Now, if you've been around the Meeting House for a while, you realize that one of the things we often talk about is that Christianity is not about keeping the religious rules. And even though I'm new, that is a message that I have been preaching for the last 20 years or so. That it's about God's grace, his unconditional love, that it's not about how well we do, it's about how he loves us. It's about the Holy Spirit empowering us And being remade into his image. And so it's not about the rules. But but when you get that message of grace. When you really understand it. It almost inevitably leads to some confusion. Because there's still a lot of rules in the Bible. Right? Like if it's all about grace. Why do I find so many rules in this book. And, and I don't just mean the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well contains tons of rules. And so when you get the message of grace, I think one of the, the hardest things is to figure out how to relate to the rules then in the Bible. How do I, what do I do with all these commandments? If it, if it doesn't affect the way God sees me, then uh, why bother? And if you've never asked that question, it may be that you have never really got the message of grace, because I think that it always leads to that question. So today, hopefully, I'll give you some stuff to think about um, in terms of how we relate those things. I want to turn to the book of Exodus. That's where we find the story of the Exodus from Egypt. It makes sense, right? Um, And the Israelites have been rescued by God, from Egypt, through Moses. And they've wandered a bit, but this is only a few weeks after that. They come to Mount Sinai. That's our first mountain. And we'll start in Exodus 19, starting at verse 16. If you have a Bible or a Bible app. Exodus 19, starting at verse 16, says, On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. And the whole mountain trembled violently. As the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder... Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. The Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up. 
I don't know if you can imagine being there, seeing all of this stuff, the crazy storm, the fire, the smoke, the cloud, the, the earth is quaking, and that trumpet blast that's getting louder and louder. I have a daughter who sometimes practices wind instruments at home, and I can understand how a trumpet blast getting louder and louder would make an impression even if there is an earthquake going on. And actually, this whole situation here seems to be designed to make an impression, doesn't it? Like you might, you might think, well, that's just what happens when God comes down to a mountain, right? Like it's the laws of Bible physics or something like that. But actually, no. In the, another passage in the Old Testament, God visits a mountain and there's fire and there's wind and there's an earthquake. And he's not in any of those things. He's actually in the sound of a gentle whisper, a still small voice. So, so that says to me that God is intentionally doing all these things in order to communicate something. Is it to com communicate to Moses who has to walk up into those things? I don't think so. I think it's to communicate to the people to say, hey, you're not going to see what goes on at the top of this mountain. But when that guy comes back down, you probably should listen to him. I don't think this whole thing would have been quite the same if it was just a nice sunny day like it is out today. And Moses says, hey, I'm going for a hike. And then he comes back and says, well, God told me some things. So all of this drama is to make an impression to say there's something really significant about to happen. And, and it is incredibly significant because on Mount Sinai, God gives his Torah, his laws, his instructions. He enters into a covenant or an official relationship with his people. And he gives them the stipulations, the guidelines, the rules that are to guide their end of the covenant. And so this is something that 36 centuries later is still affecting us. This was a, a history-changing moment. And so God is communicating that through the natural world, not so much for Moses' sake, but for the people that would hear what he had to say when he came back down. Now, when he gets to the top of the mountain, what does he say? You just flip over a few verses to Exodus 20, and it starts this way. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, or Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, it's really interesting that it starts that way. God doesn't start by making a demand. God starts by reminding them of what he had already done for them. How he had heard their cries and came down and rescued them from slavery. And I think that's really important when we think about relating to law or rules and commandments in the Bible as Christians. Is that it always begins with what God has done for us. Grace always comes before law. God gives before he ever asks anything of us. And so God is not giving his people laws as a way to earn his favor, to earn, you know, him fighting on their behalf. He's giving them his laws as a way for them to respond to the grace he's already shown them, to what he's already done for them. And so then what follows is one of the most famous passages in the Bible, the, the Ten Commandments. And so... I have these rocks here symbolizing the Ten Commandments. And I have this backpack to collect them in. And so God says, he gives them, gives them some, some rules. So have no other gods before me. He says, you know, don't make any images to worship. He says, don't misuse my name or take my name in vain. He says, uh, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He says, uh, let's see, number five, honor your father and mother. So it may go well with you in the land. Um, don't murder. That's maybe easier one. Um, don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. And don't want to do those things. Don't covet. Okay, and, and that's part of what Moses received on the mountain. But, but God didn't stop there, actually. Tradition says that God gave Moses the first five books of the Bible. Tradition says that, that God gave Moses all of his commands, all of his laws, not just the ten. 
And tradition also says that if you counted through them, that in the Law of Moses, the first five books, the Pentateuch, you would find 613 commandments. And I don't have 613 rocks. So I just wrote 603 on this one to, uh, it's a little bigger. By the way, these are authentic Muskoka rocks and they'll be for sale for about $50 a piece after the service if uh, you want a piece of Muskoka. So here's all these commands that God has given the Israelites. And 613, you know, that's quite a bit. But if you fast forward 1,600 years or so to the time of Jesus, the first century, what you'll find is that over those centuries, over those years, the religious people in Israel have decided that 613 wasn't nearly enough. Okay, and so they did this thing called building the fence around the Torah. They wanted to make sure that nobody even got close to breaking one of the Torah commands, the 613. And so they made extra rules just to set up a safety net. And so by the time of Jesus, you've got all these rules, all these traditions, all of these things that are packed onto the backs of everyday people. Jesus comes onto the scene and he says, you Pharisees, you religious leaders, you scribes, woe to you because you tie up heavy loads on people's backs and you're not willing to lift a finger to help them. I notice no one's coming to help me right now. And so... For the everyday people in Jesus' day, they're not only burdened with all these rules and laws, but they're also oppressed by the Romans. And so they don't have, they don't have a lot of extra time to be religious, right? They can barely live up to the Ten Commandments, let alone the 613 plus the other commandments that uh, the religious leaders have made up for them to obey. And so they experience the demands of God, the the laws of God as a heavy load. And then Jesus comes along and he says, you know what? If you're tired, if you're weary, come to me. Learn from me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And they say, someone finally gets it, right? Someone finally understands how hard it is to do all this stuff. Maybe because he's a carpenter, a builder, he understood what it was like for an everyday person to try to follow the rules and the commands. And so I want to bring us now to our second mountain. It's uh, described in Matthew 5, verses 1 to 2. It says this, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. And what follows there is the Sermon on the Mount, which is another very famous passage in the Bible. And particularly for us as Anabaptists, the Sermon on the Mount has always been like the key, like the big deal. And so Jesus delivers the Sermon on the Mount. But what we often, well, what I've never noticed before until I was preparing for this is that the words that Jesus, or that Matthew uses to say that Jesus went up on the mountainside are the exact same words. The phrase is exactly the same word for word as when the Greek Old Testament, so the Septuagint, describes Moses going up the mountain. And so knowing Matthew and knowing what he's doing with his gospel and his knowledge of the Old Testament that he weaves through it, I don't think this is a coincidence. I think Matthew chose those words, that description, in order to give a big hint to people who are reading that, oh, okay, up the mountain, this is another Moses. This is another Sinai. And this is God giving another Torah, a new Torah. And so I think that that's a little bit of a a flag there for us to pay attention. And so here we are on the mountain. This time people are allowed to come with him. And so the people are surrounding him. 
ready to hear a new word from Yahweh, ready to receive a new law. And they're all carrying these backpacks and they're all hoping that maybe Jesus is going to help them lighten the load, take some things out of there, maybe simplify what it means to love and follow God. And so that is why it's a bit surprising when just a couple verses in, in verse 17, you hear these words from Jesus. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven or God. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven or God. For I tell you that unless your righteousness, everyday people carrying these heavy loads, unless your righteousness surpasses that, of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't be part of what I have come to do. And so I'm sure that as Jesus is saying these things, he's, he's not getting all smiles and nods, right? He's, he's getting questioning looks. He's getting mouths kind of open. He's, he's getting like, what are you talking about? How, how is that even possible? What does it even mean to have righteousness? That surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees. And so, he says, all right, let me tell you. Well, Moses told you not to murder, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, none of us have murdered here. Well, have you ever hated your brother? Have you ever been angry with them? Yeah, don't do that. Have you ever called them names like, you fool? Have you ever written them off, shown contempt to them so that, you know, you're just like, ugh, them, yeah, don't do that. That's, that's a lot like murder in your heart. And he says, uh, oh, you remember the one about don't commit adultery? And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, we haven't done that either. Well, have you ever wanted to? Have you ever lusted after someone? Don't lust. Don't even want to. And then he says stuff like, you know, love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. And he just keeps putting more and more into these people's backpacks. Can you imagine what that felt like to, to want some relief, to want, you know, someone to lighten the load? And Jesus is not taking away commandments. He's adding to them and making the pack even heavier. And here we are, 2,000 later, years later, and I don't know about you, but I still wonder about that. I still read the Sermon on the Mount and go, wow, this is hard. This is not easier than what Moses brought. And we still get confused about why Jesus, if it's all about his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and his love and his accepting us as we are, not as we should be, which is about all those things, then why the rules? Why the commandments? Why why these things that are hard to do? And over the centuries, Christians have gone one of two ways. They've either fallen into legalism, where they overemphasize the rules and commandments. They judge their value. They judge their standing before God by their ability to keep these commandments. Or they go the other way into what's known as antinomianism or against the law. And they say, we don't actually need the rules anymore. We have the Holy Spirit and if uh, we miss the Holy Spirit, then we've got grace to fall back on. And, you know, God's given us an unlimited credit limit, so why not use it? Let us sin so that grace may increase. And over the centuries, Christians have zigzagged back and forth between those things. And the reason is because both of them supply a simple answer. And the biblical answer is neither of them, but is actually a little bit more complex. A third way that's in the middle that says, no, we don't judge ourselves by the rules and laws. And yet we're still called to obey God. We're still given directions from him. And I think what can really help us to make sense of this is to see it 
from a proper Jewish understanding of the law. See, the Jews, when they were at their best, never experienced the Torah as a heavy burden. It was the most incredible gift that God had ever given them. It was the gift of clarity, of direction, of knowledge. It was a gift that helped them shape their community identity. It helped them know what he wanted from them. It helped them respond to all that he had done for them. And it also helped them when they went off track, when they messed up, it helped them know how to get back on track. David, I think, expresses a healthy Jewish understanding in Psalm 19. Starting at verse 7, he says, The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. They give us wisdom. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. That's actually where this whole sermon grew out of is as we were reflecting. Jesus said, I've given you my commandments so that your joy may be full. And I thought, joy from commandments? The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them are righteous. They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. They're helpful when we go off track. And in keeping them, there is great reward. They're rewarding when we're on track. And so I think that we can learn a lot from that perspective on the law. That, that the law is not meant to be this heavy burden that we carry. What's it meant to do then? Well, actually in Psalm 119, there are a couple places where the psalmist says, he talks about God's commands as a path. And he says, teach me to walk in the path of your commands because there I find delight. A little bit later says, I run in the path of your commands because you've set my heart free. And so if there's a main point I want you to take away from today, it's that the commands of God were not meant to be for us a burden to carry. They were meant to be a path to walk. They were meant to give us direction and direction on a couple of different things. First of all, they give us direction on what the best life looks like. Do you, do you trust that God has your best in mind? Do you trust that God is generous and giving? That he loves you so much that, that he would die to be with you? Well then, probably, if he's going to give us instructions and a path to walk, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be the path to our best life. In fact, we couldn't come up with a better life than the one that God has for us. The other thing that this path does is it gives us a path, just like the Israelites, to responding to God. To showing our gratitude and our love to him. And so when we walk this path, in the path of his commands, it's not about earning his favor. It's about responding to it. It's not about somehow getting his, his blessings or gifts. It's about thanking him for all that he's given us. And so our obedience never earns anything from God. But it does say thank you to God. And so I want to challenge us on our relationship to the rules and the commandments. Because if you're anything like me, it's a struggle. I don't like being told what to do. And so there's automatically a bit of resistance. Maybe you're someone who has received the message of grace. That it's not about the religious rules. And, and so you've just left them behind. Set the heavy pack down and Woohoo! Let's do whatever we want. I'm sure the Holy Spirit will lead. Don't really need the rules. And that's not actually the, the picture that Jesus paints or that the Bible paints. The rules themselves are an expression of his grace. There's something that we can find joy in, that we can delight in. Or maybe you're here and the rules are weighing you down. You've slipped into legalism. You judge yourself by how well you live up to God's rules. Like, you know, for me, at one point, it was whether I did my devotions, whether I read my Bible and prayed every day, those were the rules that I judged my relationship with God on. 
That was my way of earning his favor. Like if I spent time with him in the morning, my day would go well. And if not, he might, you know, send some smites toward me. If you're under that, set that pack down. It's never meant to be something for you to carry. It's meant to be a path to walk on. And it's a good path. And we always stray. And the point of a path is not just to show us where to go. It's to help, us show, help show us where not to go and get us back on track. And so my challenge is to think that through. Very practically, I would encourage you to read through Psalm 119. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. And it is a love poem to the commands of God. And we can learn from that Jewish perspective that says clarity is good. The commands of God were not meant to be a burden to carry. They were meant to be a path to walk by. A gracious, good, and wonderful path. So let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have humbled yourself not only in the form of Jesus, but all through biblical history to, to speak, to reach out, to offer your commands, to offer your instructions. Forgive us for making those things either into a load that we have to carry on our own and forgive us for just ignoring them when they're such a great privilege. God, would you put a right attitude in our hearts and help us to love running in the path that you've laid out for us through your commands, your Torah, your instruction. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope that was meaningful for you as we heard from Jeremy about Jesus and the law. And maybe you're hearing about this Jesus-Moses connection for the first time. Or maybe you've been carrying a burden for a long time and you just needed to hear today about Jesus teaching, walking, and living out this proper approach to God's commandments and how to live out of clarity and with thanksgiving. Well, wherever you're at, we would love to hear from you and to have you join us either here next week or at a lo location near you for whatever's going on on whatever day of the week. And if you want to find out more about that, you can start by hitting up our website for more info. I hope that the rest of your week is restful wherever you are, and thank you so much for joining us today.